From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Mike Cosper, and with me as always is Russell Moore. Today on our show, we're going to talk about the Amazon documentary series, Shiny Happy People, and we'll be joined by Alex Harris, who appeared in it. Then, John Onwuchekwa will join us to talk about the reasons people are leaving the church and how our moment might look different from other moments in the past few decades. We'll also talk about the legacy of Pat Robertson, who passed away yesterday, and the sonic boom heard around D.C. Stay with us. This week, Amazon released a docu-series called Shiny Happy People, Duggar Family Secrets, on their Prime Video platform. The series focuses primarily on the family of Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar, who starred in the reality TV series 18 Kids and Counting. There were other variations, 17, 19. But anyway, the series covers a lot of ground, homeschooling, the political connections, their connection to Bill Gothard's ministry, and of course the scandals and crimes of their eldest son, Josh Duggar. Homeschooling played a significant part of this story. And joining us to talk a little bit about the show and about the issues that are raised by the show is Alex Harris, who appeared in the documentary as well. Alex, welcome to The Bulletin. Thank you both so much for having me. Alex is an attorney and a writer. His family had deep roots in the homeschooling movement. His father and mother, early pioneers in the movement. His older brother, Joshua Harris, was a young star in the movement. Later, Alex and his brother, Brett, were influential voices as well. They wrote a book as teens called Do Hard Things. That had a forward by Chuck Norris. I didn't realize that until I was looking through it this morning. <laughs> so Alex, l- let me start by asking, I won't ask about Chuck, what made you interested in participating in this documentary? You know, there were really two primary reasons. The first was that the producers approached me and they had seen some things that I had written elsewhere about politics and the Joshua generation, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about. And they were interested in kind of telling a larger story. Obviously, the focus of the series even then was on the Duggar family and more generally Bill Gothard and his ministry. But they wanted to take a kind of a wider angle at parts of the documentary and talk about the Christian homeschooling movement, the Joshua generation, and the intersection between those streams and politics. And that's something that is on my heart because that's my life. That's something that I feel needs to be discussed for the good of the church and and the good of the gospel, of gospel witness in the United States especially. And so I wanted, if they were going to try to tell that story, you know, to help them Mm -hmm. tell it accurately, to tell it, you know, from the perspective of someone who still very much believes the gospel, who follows Christ and is seeking to be faithful, it's understandable, especially in a series like Shiny Happy People, that a lot of the voices you're going to hear are people who have been just horrifically wounded, abused, spiritually, physically, sexually, you name it, and as a result are probably more likely to have rejected, moved away from prior beliefs. And I wanted to be a voice that says, no, even those of us who had good experiences have some real concerns about aspects of the movement. And if that could buttress in any way the voices of people who were much more hurt, that was also a motivation for me in wanting to be involved. Alex, sometimes when people from the outside of any religious movement do a docuseries like this. Sometimes they don't know enough to know some of the right questions to ask. Were there things in the documentary that you thought, I wish they had given me the opportunity to speak to this? Yes and no. Some of the producers who were involved in this, they had done their homework Mm -hmm. and they asked me a lot of questions before I even agreed to be involved, because I, it took me a while before I was comfortable saying yes to participate. The interview itself was conducted by other folks, and they asked a lot of the questions, for sure. I spent a whole day with them, and my segment in the documentary, I think, is maybe seven minutes of that, and maybe a couple minutes of me actually speaking, as opposed to other voices and B-roll footage and the like. So... There was a lot said that didn't actually make it into the final cut, which is just the nature of any sort of documentary series. One of the things you focused on in the documentary or that they focused on with you in the documentary was the Joshua generation 
saying, could you give us kind of a pencil sketch of what that is? And, you know, you've mentioned some concerns around that, what, what those are as well. Yeah. So the Joshua generation is an analogy to the Old Testament leader, patriarch Joshua, who led the children of Israel into the promised land after Moses and the, the kind of the Moses generation came out of captivity in Egypt. And so the analogy, which has been used in political and non-political contexts by a number of different people, but the analogy in the homeschool context was the Moses generation are those homeschool parents who in the 1980s and 90s chose to remove their kids from what they viewed as a horribly decayed public school system, both morally and educationally, who raised them, quote unquote, in the wilderness to educate them and to instill in them Christian values, Christian faith. But then our generation, my generation, we were the Joshua generation, and we would rise up to take the land for God and for Christ and Christian values. And this was not just a theoretical or metaphysical or spiritual idea, the specific examples of what this would look like that were given were homeschool students will disproportionately be the U.S. senators and the U.S. presidents and the Supreme Court justices of the next generation. And in so doing, they will help restore America to its rightful position as a, as a truly Christian nation. And of course, the analogy with Joshua, Joshua was coming into a land occupied with enemies who have to be defeated and overcome. And so there's a sense of siege, isn't there? There is. And those ideas were not as often stated. I don't have specific memories of the people who were using this imagery talking about defeating the enemies of God, but that's inherent in the analogy, as you point out. And some of the thinkers and writers who really influenced some of those early Christian homeschool leaders very much used language much more about defeating the enemies of God and a kind of a no holds barred and you know much more militant type of thinking, which I think you see not just in the Joshua generation expression, but also more broadly where that idea seeped into the broader religious right. Yeah, I'm curious, you know, you talked in the documentary about how, you know, the, the homeschooling movement is not a monolith and there are people kind of all over the spectrum in that. And that definitely reflects my I know a lot of people who were homeschooled or are homeschooled and for a lot of various reasons. But again, the Gothard thing plays a prominent role. You were around that in that community. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what the Gothard influence looked like around you as a kid. And does it surprise you to see this emergence of the, or revisiting of the story, the, the, the emergence of the scandal around it? Yeah, it's so interesting. Some of the things I know today are things I only learned as an adult. But a lot of the things that are, are raised now, I think like many people watching the docuseries, it's like, oh, I remember that, or I remember hearing that, or I remember my friends who really were into that. So I grew up, you know, just very much surrounded by the Christian homeschool community. And Gothard was a highly influential leader and, and voice within that community, along with my father, Greg Harris. And so there was just significant overlap. You know, it's a big world. It's a diverse world in some senses, but it's also a small world. And everybody, it feels like, knows everybody. And so we had many families who were involved in Bill Gothard's ministry in various ways and, and to various degrees of depth. Our church was almost entirely homeschool families. So they were following all of the rules for everything from what kind of music you could listen to, to what kind of clothes you could wear, whether you could have facial hair, the length of your hair if you're a woman. And it was kind of always the sense that the Gothard people were maybe a little bit the weird homeschoolers you know, the more stereotypical weird homeschoolers with the denim jumpers down to their ankles. And then the rest of us, we were the cool homeschoolers. And yet, I think looking back, you see how some of the ideas more generally really permeated more broadly, even than those who were more obviously influenced. And so looking back, there were so many warning signs. And I know people, some of the survivors who shared their stories in the documentary, but I know a number of other families with similar heartbreaking, horrendous stories that have never been told publicly. 
And so I think over the past 10, 15, 20 years, there has just been a growing wave of people coming forward and telling these stories. And it's heartbreaking. And the people who first told those stories, including going back decades, unfortunately, Gothard's first public accusations of, of impropriety were in the early 80s and barely did anything to halt the progress and growth of his ministry. But the people who in the 2000s and the early 2010s who were telling these stories, including a lot of homeschool graduates, they were the very brave ones who ultimately led to Gothard stepping down from his ministry position. But I recall when those stories were coming out, I was in law school at the time and processing a whole bunch of things. And I don't know that I've fully even processed it now. Watching the documentary, I think, for many people has been a form of processing. And I was... You know, in many ways spared from the worst of it, but close enough to see the fruit. So Alex, let me ask you a question that many people ask me. Why, having seen all of this stuff, both just sort of the gut intuitions that said, mm, something's wrong here, and then having seen what we saw in the series, which is chilling, why are you still a Christian? The grace of God. I am so grateful for my parents who... I I differ and disagree with on some things, and yet I can say they taught me the gospel, and they taught me to love God's word. They taught me that the church always needs reforming, and they set me up to think and, and read and reflect on what was going on around me. And as I've grown, I mean, God has just been kind to place me in positions where some of my presuppositions were challenged to put me in some churches, maybe a little bit more removed from some of the cultural background that I grew up in with pastors who just faithfully preached the word and helped me see Jesus more clearly. A Jesus who's not just a card-carrying member of the Republican Party or, or any political party. And over time, I think I was able to disentangle the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of Christ from some of the distortions that had previously been just kind of enmeshed in my understanding of what it meant to follow Christ. But the core calling of being faithful, of loving God and loving my neighbor, you know, that was instilled in me by my parents. That was instilled in a whole bunch of homeschool graduates by parents who were genuinely trying to do their best, but who may have been, or their kids may have been, exposed to some ideas within the larger movement that were unhealthy. The Shiny Happy People, it's a, one example among several recent documentaries, you know, news coverage, podcasts, CT has covered these things of scandals within the evangelical world. And one of the critiques that comes up again and again is that, you know, oh, this is just failure porn, clickbait, all of this. You kind of spoke to that. You wrote an article at the Gospel Coalition And let me just read this. And you said this is referring to that there was an awareness of scandal at the time that wasn't addressed all the way back in the early 1980s of sexual impropriety inside Gothard's ministry. And an article in a 1984 issue of the Journal of Pastoral Practice suggests that part of the reason pastors didn't want to address it because they didn't want to risk, quote, offending their congregation or constituency, among whom Gothard likely had some avid followers. The article was published only a few years after the first major sex abuse scandal in Gothard's organization, including public accusations of impropriety and moral failures involving Gothard and a secretary. And then you write this. You said, how many evils could have been prevented if faithful Christians hadn't looked away? Let me put this to both of you. I think that's so well put that the need to not look away, the need to address these things. Russ, you say this often, judgment begins with the house of God. Are we seeing positive fruit from this moment, from this reckoning, from the telling of these stories? I think we are, and I think we will because there is no separation in Scripture of truth from grace. And so, as Paul put it, to lie in order to advance the truth is blasphemy. So I think that a sense of reordering and repentance, as well as if there is a freedom from cynicism, and I think there's there's more than one way to become cynical. I mean, one of those ways is to say, Well, because I've been lied to, that means everybody's lying to me. And because an institution was predatory, that means every institution is predatory. That's one way of cynicism. But the other way of cynicism is to say, well, 
think of all the good things that happen. And that means that in order to be a good soldier, I need to keep quiet something that Jesus just never did. That's cynical too. And I think when people see that, what they see is just another dark human organization covering its tracks. And that's not what the bride of Christ is. So so there needs to really be an unveiling of the glory of Christ in a way that is Christ-like. Jesus just doesn't do spin control about himself or about his church. He tells the truth. I think we need to too. I feel like both of you, you know, probably have your finger on the the pulse of of the kind of the broader evangelical world more so than I do. I'm hopeful, and and my certainly my reasons for telling the stories that I've been telling and, and raising the concerns that I've been raising is out of the hope that it will bear good fruit. It is these stories and concerns are shared out of a love for the church and a desire to see it be the church as opposed to being instead a a stumbling block to the gospel, which unfortunately in many ways it has been. And and it's been that way not because bad stories of abusive leaders have come out, but because of abusive leaders and because of the covering up of abuse in the favor of power and seeming fruit at the expense of the most vulnerable members of these communities. And so I'm, I'm hopeful. You know, I think so many of the problems and the things that are being exposed are cultural baggage that has been piled on top of the church and, and of the gospel. And, and, and it, the, you need a shaking to shake some of that, that baggage loose. And I've seen members of the Joshua generation who you know, the past several years and some of these stories and revelations about things that were so central to their childhoods and young adulthoods, uh, that it has shaken some, some of that cultural baggage loose. I've seen in the Moses generation, you know, some of the homeschool parents who, you know, again, I think the vast majority of whom were just trying to do their best to be faithful and as best they knew how, but they've been shaken and some of that cultural baggage has fallen loose. And what I hope remains is the original Jesus. And that's a phrase that my pastor, Hunter Beaumont in Denver uses a lot. Our, our church exists to help people find the, the original Jesus, the Jesus in scripture, free of all the cultural baggage that especially in America has, has just accumulated over time. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining us this week on the bulletin. Thank you for the work that you're doing, talking about these things as well. Thank you both for the work you are doing. Joining us now is John Onwuchekwa, CT's Director of Resources. John, thanks for jumping on today. Yeah, thanks, man. Glad to be here. So this week... Jessica Gross wrote in her newsletter for the New York Times, well, the title of the newsletter was, Why Do People Lose Their Religion? More than 7,000 readers share their stories. It seemed apt to me, given the conversation we had with Alex Harris and the conversations that are happening right now around shiny, happy people, you know, what she identifies in the newsletter are really three paths in the stories that appeared again and again. The first one is seekers, people who often changed religion several times often during their lives. Skeptics, people who had an abrupt break in their faith, usually in their youth. And what she called slow faders, people who drifted away in their faith. Usually this was later in life. Let me start with you, John, actually. You know, you've been a pastor, you've been a church planter, you've spent a lot of time with people wrestling with their faith. I'm curious how those three streams kind of map on what you've observed and the conversations you've had around this. So I read the article and so she had that little like four grid at the top, right? The religionist, uh, the non-religionist, secularist, religious, secularist. I thought that that four was a good model. And then she went and said, ah, well, that really doesn't capture. But that stream, (laughs) I found like, like, yeah, those three to really be spot on. Right. And Mm -hmm. it's uh, strange. Like, so I've seen a common trend of people pulling away from their faith. And the most common thing that I've seen is that no two people have exactly the same story. Right. So it really has been this thing where there are general things that are the same, but there is such a wide spectrum that there is no like 
one antibiotic that solves it all, right? Right. Russell, well, so how did you react to that? Did that feel like that mapped on what you've observed or has it changed over the years? Well, I think that the way that the article was trying to put these types together, it was almost like uh, trying to find a parable of the sower and the soils <laughs> all, all over right. again. <laughs> and uh, to some degree, I do think that the distinctions were right. There, There is a difference between the person who suddenly says, I don't believe anymore and the person who slowly fades out. And I've seen a lot of that. There are people who were, again, go back to the parable of the sower in the soils. There were people who were fervent, and then just over time, they're worn down in various ways. Where I would differ with the piece, and I write about this in this book I have coming out to later this summer, is this sense that I'm seeing of people who are not just falling away, but angered and hurt in a unique mm-hmm. way. Yeah, when I first started in ministry, people would come up and say, I'm thinking about leaving Christianity and thinking about leaving the church. It was almost always one of two things. It was either I can't accept some supernatural aspect of Christianity. Maybe they were having troubles with reconciling Genesis with science, or maybe they were just concluding, hey, I can't believe that a virgin got pregnant or that a dead man came back to life. You'd have that type of person. And then you would have somebody who would say, I disagree with the moral rules of the church in some way or or the other. Now, increasingly, I, I almost never hear that. Instead, you have people who are saying, I've concluded the church is itself immoral. And they have all kinds of reasons and good reasons often to say that. And so that's what worries me is that we're facing not just the headwinds of secularization, and we are, but also you have such a compromised gospel and moral witness of the church itself that we're losing some of the people with the most moral clarity. And mm-hmm. you have people who are who are hurt. The other thing that I would say is we're in a time right now where a lot of the people who seem to be falling away actually aren't necessarily falling away. It's something that happens in anybody's life. They're going through a kind of dark night of the soul, but we're in a Mm -hmm. cultural moment where everything is instantly committed to and published in some way or the other. Mm -hmm. And so what in previous generations might have been a kind of private wrestling to, is this really my faith? Do I really believe this Mm -hmm. now is much more public? And of course, as we know from studies, Something that you commit to publicly, it becomes really difficult to walk back from it. Yeah, I have I have two thoughts on that. I, I think the last thing you said there really resonates with me. And, and I think there's an element of it that has been prominent in my church experience my whole life, where experiences of disruption because of doubt, because of loss, because of grief or trauma or whatever the, the case Oftentimes, the churches I I grew up in and was around or the kind of Christianity that I heard a lot about didn't categorize that well. Mm -hmm. And and, and in some ways, that shaped the the kinds of churches we wanted to plant 20 years ago because we recognized a little bit that there was something that we were intuiting about that. I I hadn't thought about that social media angle that you just described, but I think that makes a lot of sense. The other thing that I've thought a, a lot about is the conversations I had with unbelievers or people who were losing their faith 20 years ago versus the ones I'm having now. Because 20 yeah. years ago, people who were there on the fringes, similar to what you you said, the dominant thing that I was hearing were people who were curious about other religions, interested in sort of the drift, mm-hmm. or the moral questions were often about things like sexual ethics, like yeah. like they didn't like the church's position on homosexuality. They didn't like the church's position on, you know, whether it was premarital sex or whatever the case. I hardly hear either of those anymore. I think social media is actually a factor in the sexual ethics stuff because it's so easy to find community online with people who would say, you don't have to lose your faith and transform the way you think about gay marriage, right? right? That wasn't the case 20 years ago. I find almost all of the conversations with people who are on the edge are about politics and church scandal. And part of that is what's called survivor bias. 
you know, if you're talking to the people who are in the church, even if they're people who are on their way out, a lot of that with the anti-supernaturalism and the rejection of the, the moral ethics, that's already been filtered out. And so you have a situation now where it's not culturally costly in most contexts to say, I'm not religious, I'm not a Christian, I don't belong to a church. So those categories can get filtered out a lot quicker. It's when you then end up with the people who really do believe in God, really do believe in the gospel, but who are looking around and saying, wait a minute, is this what this is? Is this really just a political mobilization strategy, or is this just a money-making operation, or yeah. worse, is this a way to sexually prey upon people? When they start asking those questions, there's a genuine crisis that says, is Jesus really there? Right. And I mean, as somebody who went through that, I understand it, and it's heartbreaking that there's almost a protection racket in the church to say, if you address those concerns, you're not one of us, which right. furthers right. the problem. I'd love to hear maybe how some of this lands on y'all. So I've, yeah, just thinking more about what y'all have talked about just in terms of hurt and frustration and grief and trauma. I do think there are large swaths of folks who all this stuff does make them more discerning thinkers, right? And they come off better as a result of it. But now it seems like it's everywhere. And one of the things that I've seen is that you've got a group of folks now who don't necessarily become more discerning thinkers. They just become different thinkers, right? So mm -hmm. whereas it was, I adopted the things that I heard in my church and my stream of Christianity full sail, and I was taught to be suspicious of every and anything else out there as a result of the hurt. It's not as if they're like, all right, let me examine things more closely, but it's just a differing. All right, now I'm going to be suspicious of any and everything Christian, and I'm going to be open to any and everything else out there. So the discernment muscles haven't really been trained. It's just more so mm -hmm. I'm changing the voices that are really going to input and I'm just going to take all of what they say wholesale. So one, have y'all seen it? And two, what seems like, yeah, a good way to address that and just to disarm folks and say, hey, at the end of the day, we're just trying to be a little more discerning. I think that's a really important question, right? Is, yeah. is, how is the church? Because you do have outside of the church, you have a marketplace. And I don't mean that cynically. I, I just mean sort of a world of ideas that are conversations around trauma, conversations around vulnerability, conversations around emotional health and wellness. And I mean, there's lots of positive and good things to say about all of that. I, I, yeah. I don't say that to say it negatively, except that what I find interesting is that people inside the church, they have these traumatic experiences or they have these encounters or they're just witnessing it and it's, it's breaking their hearts. And they look outside the church and they find a language and a community to deal with a lot of the stuff that's going on internally. Right. What was helpful to me because I had my encounter with this in the last, you know, seven, eight years. What was so helpful to me was a, was a, a mentor, you know, who was kind of a spiritual director throughout it, who just kind of kept coming back to me and saying, you know what, go to first Kings 18 and 19 and just look at what yeah. happened to Elijah, go yeah, to right. the sermon on the Mount. And, yeah. and I mean, I spent probably four years in those two chapters, the right. Psalms and the right. sermon on the Mount. Yeah. And, you know, what you see in First Kings 18 and 19 is Elijah has these incredible experiences of the power and the glory of God. And then he goes to the desert and says, I want to die. Right. <laughs> this right. was useless. Right. It did nothing. Right. I want to die. Yeah. And so those encounters with exhaustion and grief and coming to the end of yourself, I mean, you see the despair of, you know, the, some of the disciples on the night Jesus is arrested. You see it there as well. The, the church has a language and a story to tell for people who've encountered that kind of loss, the death of their dreams. And it breaks my heart to think about the fact that 
so many Christians who have those encounters don't find the place, don't find those stories, don't find that language. And think about John the Baptist, who sends messengers to Jesus to say, are you the one we've been waiting for, yeah. or, or should yeah. we wait for somebody else in his yeah. frustration in prison? I mean, this is the one who baptized him and who heard the voice from heaven, the, you are my beloved son, and with you I'm well pleased, who gets to a point who says, is this is this even real? And Jesus's response is not, go back and tell this sellout, I'm done with you. His response is to just reiterate what the gospel is. And so what really helped me through this sort of time in the last several years was uh, there's a passage in John 10, the end of John 10, in which Jesus goes back to the Jordan and the people there say, John did no sign, but everything he told us about this man was true. And I was able to differentiate between some really awful and sometimes predatory and inauthentic systems and the gospel that maybe they pointed to, but that transcended them, that didn't come Mm -hmm. from them. It, It actually was speaking to him. And if you look at what Jesus is saying throughout, not only is he very gentle and patient with people who are having this sort of disillusionment, he also tells us ahead of time, this is what the church is going to look like. And, and that it's not in a way of saying, you know, everything's got problems, so just live with it. It yeah. was in terms of this is what's going to happen. Make sure that you keep my witness pure. And so you, you go to Revelation 1 through 3, and he's speaking to churches talking about the removal of a lampstand. So it's not this sort of dismissive but it also tells us ahead of time. And a lot of times I think what people actually have to do is to get to that point where they're able to really see Jesus again. And sometimes that takes some time. And sometimes with a lot of people, we're like Simon Peter in John 6 and saying, this is really freaking me out, but to whom shall we go? We've come to believe that you have the words of eternal life. John, let me ask you this. You know, the dominant subjects in these conversations are typically white evangelical churches. You know, we were talking about this documentary. I don't know if it gets much wider than the Duggars, right? (laughs) Right, Um, right, right. I'm curious, though, like, how are these conversations filtering in or or emerging from black churches? And what are pastors and Christians in in that community wrestling with? So one of the things that is helpful, right, is like in the same way the article brought about this spectrum and distinction when it relates to people that fall away, I think it's helpful to remember that even Black people and Black churches fall along that same spectrum. So for us, one of the things that I found was that what helped give people language in our church to what went on and the struggle of faith was not John the Baptist, was not Elijah. It was actually Habakkuk, right? Who stands and he looks to God and he's like, yo, you're really going to let the Chaldeans do all of that to us, right? And he's standing and he's got this injustice in front of his eyes and he's supposed to stand on behalf of God and speak to the people, but he's like an inverse prophet. He hears that from God. And the rest of the book is saying that God, this doesn't add up. I'm not really sure. Right. And he's got to wrestle back and forth with God's justice being perfect, but it's going to be delayed. So it's been like, those are the convos that come up, right? Mm -hmm. The things that I found that have caused people to wrestle with this more and more is not necessarily the Duggars or religious Christian figures like that. It's, yo, you know, Trayvon and Mike Brown and Philando Castile and Trump in the summer of 2020 and some of the people that they looked at as siblings in the faith and seeing the apathy as it relates to those things. Those are the things that caused them to say, well, wait a minute. These are the same folks that kind of pulled me from a historical tradition and were quick to call out the errors that were there. I adopted what they said wholesale, and now there's this huge hole. And when I try to call out this hole, I'm being told I'm not one of them. What is this 
Christianity. I'm not really sure that I want to be a part of it. So those are the things that I found more that have affected people that are in my black church in the segment of yeah. blackness who do have more of an interaction with white evangelicalism than people that are found in the historically black church. Let's wrap with this. I'm interested because back to kind of the, and, and again, maybe I'm filtering this too much through my own questions about it. Sorry. Sorry if that's the case, but I, I just think about, you know, you, you look at these like generational apologetics, right? Mm. The question skeptics were asking in the 80s and then the 90s. Yeah. And then, I mean, I remember when like the new atheism was like everything. What are we going to do about, you know, the new the new atheism? Is there a way of thinking about the witness of the church, a church that's looking at this? And I, I think the common theme, in a sense, between what you're describing, John, and some of these other issues is like this question of justice, these questions of hypocrisy. What does a solid apologetic look like in our yeah. moment? Part of it is, and I think I yeah, shared this the last time that I was on, I've just been very, very deeply impacted by the trajectory that, you know, Abe Cho out of New York said, like it used to be, is Christianity true? Those were the convos that we have. Is it relevant, right? You know, is Christianity even good for society? And lastly is, no, no, is it even safe? And that to me feels like the one that we're in right now, that it's not even Christianity. I feel like so often it's not even a brand of Christianity that would hold to a lot of orthodox positions on a whole host of things. It's not even able to join the party or the Zoom call on let's all give our perspective. But there is a certain type of Christianity that's already like branded with a surgeon's general warning, right? This is unsafe. It's not good. Be careful. Enter at your own risk. Yeah. Not only are they not going to speak to the things that the rest of the world is concerned about, like grief, trauma, and things like that. But when they speak to those things, they're going to speak to it in such a way that is destructive and harmful and unsafe. So the best thing that you can do if you care about you, your children, or your communities, is to run far away from this brand. And so I do think there does have to be an aspect where we're answering questions. Not only is Christianity acceptable to join in the fray and to contribute ideas, but actually, no, no, no. There is something that we contribute to the grief conversation that nobody else really does because Resurrection does lie at the core of all of what we do. So when Paul says we grieve mm -hmm. as those with hope, there's something that we contribute that nobody else does. So it's not just one of many options. It actually is the safest way to face both tangible and ambiguous grief. And I think it's those things trying to not defend the faith on our back leg, right, but proactively uh, initiating solutions to some of the world's most pervasive problems. I think it takes a, as Martin Luther said in the 95 Theses, it takes a life of repentance from the church, a, a life of uh, being willing to constantly be corrected by Jesus. And then that being reflected in a church that is like Jesus, very gentle with a bruised reed, and willing to go in and turn over the tables in the temple when the temple is projecting something false about God and also something that preys upon vulnerable people. We have to do mm -hmm. both of those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. the question of, is it true or is it relevant or is it safe? They all really are the same question because yeah. the, the question is, is this real or is it just a means to an end? And for a lot mm -hmm. of people, I was just rereading John Updike, the novelist, talking about how he realized at one point that all of the people giving him the Christian religion in his Pennsylvania town, including the ministers, they didn't really believe it. It was yeah. just a way to mm -hmm. sort of prop up general goodness and so forth. 
now that's less the case. It's more that people are seeing a Christianity that's there to prop up a general badness or a general craziness. And when you have people who are saying, hey, wait a minute, my atheist friends are actually gentler and kinder and more reasonable than the people in my church. That's that's a problem for us. Yeah. yeah. You know, as you as you talk about, is it is it true? Is it relevant? Is it is it good? I couldn't help the the thought that came to mind was is it beautiful? Right. And yeah. and I can't help but think about the work of, of Mako Fujimura. He was on the mm-hmm. podcast last week. And that's so much of what he talks about, that there's something about beauty. There's something about making beautiful things and and contributing yeah. this sort of resurrection, generative creativity is what he calls it, that also just seems like an opportunity, a part of the conversation. Right. I think there's probably a lot to say there as well. Yeah. Yeah. We will be right back. Okay, so we are recording on Thursday morning, June 8th, and just a couple of hours ago, word broke that Pat Robertson has passed away. Robertson was the founder of the Christian Broadcast Network, CBN. He was the longtime host of the show, The 700 Club. Robertson was also extremely active in politics for most of his life. He actually ran for the Republican nomination for president during the 88 campaign. He founded the Christian Coalition, which at one time was considered one of the most powerful and influential political organizations in the country. And there was no shortage of controversy around Pat Robertson. He was considered one of the teachers of the prosperity gospel. He expressed anti-Semitic views in the aftermath of 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina. He blamed these events on ideological enemies like feminists, people who advocated for LGBTQ rights and abortion policies. Russell, you've written a number of times about Pat Robertson's words and and work. How influential on American Christianity do you think he was? I think he was quite influential, and for a number of the reasons that you mentioned, but some others. I think one of the reasons that he was so influential is that Pat Robertson didn't project the image that people already had in mind of a religious figure, of an Elmer Gantry sort of fire and brimstone sort of a figure that they could put categories. I mean, Jerry Falwell and, and, and various others, they could put in that category. But Robertson seemed more like Mr. Rogers. And so if you're just listening to the way he says things instead of necessarily what he's saying, it projected a very different kind of vision there. And then you have somebody who in many ways, Robertson gave us a preview of the Trump era because the way that Robertson initially started making his mark was with a kind of semi-reasonableness. He's sort of bringing charismatic Pentecostal theology into the mainstream of Christian broadcasting. But by the end, and by the end, I mean the last 20 years, it became a relevance that was there because of saying increasingly shocking and outrageous things. That's the reason why Pat Robertson would be in the news to the point that I made a New Year's resolution to my wife one year. I will not respond to anything that Pat Robertson says this year because this was after he had said that a man whose wife has Alzheimer's and doesn't recognize him should divorce her, find somebody else, that adopted children might bring demons into the homes where they live, that people with AIDS were wearing wearing rings that had little cutting things on them in San Francisco so that they could infect other people with AIDS. These sort of just absolutely insane sorts of things being said. And that gave him a kind of credibility with a certain subculture. The fact that he would say something that crazy must mean it's true. And it must Mm -hmm. mean that he's telling it the way that it is. And in many ways, that's what American life has become. I think it's interesting to think about him as a figure on two fronts, and you kind of got at this already, but I think about him so much of where we are in our moment right now. Media thrives on conspiracy theory and this idea of this ugly underbelly that's where all the secret stuff is really going on. And 
there is an ugly underbelly. <laughs> we, we've right. talked about the ugly underbelly, but that's not the kind of story that Robertson would tell. You know, you talked mm-hmm. about the the rings or whatever. I, you said that, and I was like, I totally remember that I mean, <laughs> as a kid, hearing exactly that story. Don't shake hands with a stranger. They might be trying to give you AIDS and, and things like that. And But he would not have been somebody that would have had a ton of influence on the churches that I grew up in, in terms of people talking about him, trying to sell his books or any of that. And yet so many of those ideas had a way of sneaking in. And I I just can't help but think about that's the power of media. He had a TV station and that was, you know, his ability to broadcast himself like Robert Schuller had this transformative influence that was so outsized for the actual ideas that would have been seen as fringe by most serious pastors, scholars, et cetera. Several years ago, I was talking to somebody who had been a psychic back in a previous uh, time, and uh, not in a previous life, but in a (laughs) previous time in his life, who was talking about how it is that it works and says the way you make money is by either telling somebody something really great is right around the corner for you or telling them great catastrophe is headed for you. And so you're going to need me to help you to avert it. Mm -hmm. What that generation of a Pat Robertson and a Jim Baker would be very similar is to take Mm -hmm. both of those things and merge them. So there's this shiny, happy prosperity gospel, send me your checks, I'll pray over them and good things are going to happen to you. And this dark sense, there's a dangerous new world order that's out there that's seeking to destroy you. Put both of those things together so you can have the jolt of fear and the jolt of Mm -hmm. something good's about to happen to me. And Mm -hmm. they're both there. I will say one of the things that I've been fascinated by ever since I first read it just a a few years ago in Wynne Collier's biography of the life of Eugene Peterson. You know, he talks about Peterson's years in college at a Bible school, theology school in New York City, and his classmate and very close friend that he almost went into ministry with was Pat mm-hmm. Robertson. Pat and Robertson. you just think about those two wow. figures, you know, That's- going to church together, hanging out, going fishing, sort of going hiking together, talking about ministry. You think, you know, man, two roads diverged in a wood. Yeah. <laughs> You yeah, a- a- and imagine. you think about Peterson was the Montana Pentecostal who didn't really know mm-hmm. how to make it in the big city. Uh, Robertson was an aristocrat. I mean, his father, Willis mm-hmm. Robertson, was a United States senator, born into wealth and privilege, and he was sort of the one who knew the urbane ways of Eastern life and would kind of show the way to Peterson. And yeah, it's hard to imagine two Christian visions of ministry being more different than those do. All right. One last thing before we wrap up, we'll make this one a quick one, but I I thought it was significant enough that I wanted to throw it out there. This is a bit of a personal obsession to me, but earlier this week (laughs) in Washington, DC, the city was pretty startled by the sound of a sonic boom. And the reason for this was that there was a a Cessna aircraft that had drifted off course, drifted into airspace that was forbidden Two F-16 fighters were scrambled to track this thing down, and the report that came out was that the pilot had fallen asleep, and ultimately the plane did crash. But it, I, I was talking to a friend who lives in D.C., and he's been there you know, since maybe 2002, 2003. It really struck me in, in that conversation that this is kind of a throwback to those days. It, it reawakens that post-9-11 experience. He's like, that's what we were all thinking about. When you hear the boom, you, that's what you thought something had somebody had crashed already. Right. And um, I, I have this obsessive question in my mind that I just want to throw out there. No way we can fully explore it. But I wonder to what extent we have reckoned with the spiritual implications of the years after 9-11. You know, Kristen Kobus Dume talks about it a bit in Jesus and John Wayne, and she attributes that to the adoption of a certain amount of uh, sort of militarized Christianity. Tim Keller has talked about it too, because he would point to a revival in New York that took place in the years after 9 11. 
the church planting that took place with my generation, that our church has really started to explode after 9-11. So there's something there. But I also just think about this age of anxiety. When you suddenly hear an explosion out of nowhere, again, if you if you lived through those years, you you think about them different. And I just want to throw it to both of you. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, do you have a sense of how that may have affected the Gen Xers, the elder millennials who were living through those days and how that affects the way we see the world now? I'm just relieved, Mike, because I thought you were going to say, could this be uh, alien uh, UFOs? That's what I thought. (laughs) I was thinking, Pat Robertson just died. You're already trying to replace him (laughs) with conspiracy theories. Uh, So I'm, I'm very relieved that this is where the conversation is going. I don't know. I think one of the big things that we've learned in the post September 11th era is that I think there's a mindset that a lot of, especially Christians had, and many other Americans too, that all we really need is a big crisis and the country unites. So kind of that watchman idea of if actual uh, aliens in, invade New York, then the, the country is going to come together as one. And I think what we have seen is in the days after September 11th, that did seem to happen. But after Iraq war, Katrina, pandemic, Trump era, I think, I don't think we have as much confidence that this is going to, that some big crisis is what will pull us all together. Yeah. Those were my exact thoughts, Mm. like that it did feel like things were unique there, whether racial tensions were, yeah, whether that raging stream had calmed enough where it wasn't really a concern. 2020, right? That that was the one, right? That it wasn't even another nation, really. It was this global crisis. So the closest thing to aliens, right? Independence Day is all about, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. Aliens come, so the whole world has to band together. And it's strange in that I think it's not even a concern that we won't band together. It is a concern like, no, 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 no. I think there's something fundamentally broken about where we are here because we traveled during the pandemic. So November of that year, we went to Mexico and then I went to another place. And I was surprised how whenever I would travel, every other country, everybody was on the same page. There was not this war But then when I'd come back here, it felt like, oh, no, 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 we have something unique here. Everybody else is unifying and we're not. So there's something fundamentally broken here. And you think about who among the unifying figures, the grown up in the room that sort of encouraged us to all come together, Rudy Giuliani. And in one generation, we've gone from ground zero to four seasons total landscaping. (laughs) Uh, it, it's it's almost a metaphor. <laughs> oh, yeah, I tell you what. I, I one of the reasons why I love the movie Arrival is because it's kind of the counter version of the story of Independence Day. Uh, the yes, aliens yes. all arrive, and the point of the movie Arrival is without sort of the divine intervention of the aliens themselves, we turned on each other. It was a pathway to war, and so yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder, and, and here we are, we're coming out of, you know, still sort of re- reckoning with the, the pandemic, like when anxiety rocks an entire society for, you know, this suspended period of time, what does it do to the soul? What does it do to the yeah. curiosity? What does it do to the seeker? And mm. it's, it's one of those questions for me that I, I just keep coming back to and it reminded me of it this week. So We yeah. need Pentecost to unify us. Pearl Harbor won't do it. Right. Yeah. Mm. Well, on that note, thank you both for joining me and uh, thank all of you for listening to the bulletin this week. We will see you next week. All right. That's it for us this week. If you're enjoying our show, please consider subscribing to CT. Not only does it give you access to everything on our website and of course the magazine itself, but it also helps support our work at CT media so we can bring you more podcasts like this. You can do that online at christianitytoday.com slash membership. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's executive produced by Eric Petrick. 
It's produced by Matt Stevens. It's hosted by Russell Moore and Mike Cosper. Azure Phelps is our associate producer. The show is edited and mixed by TJ Hester. Graphic design by Brian Todd. Additional design by Amy Jones. Music by Dan Phelps. Social media by Kate Lucky. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Thank you.